I mean, me personally, I think that the Blackout Ripper and Jack the Ripper were the same person. I mean, it makes sense when you think about it. Their sprees were only 54 years apart, which means, do the math, Jack the Ripper was a wee lad when he committed those crimes. Huh? The Blackout Ripper was only 27 years old when he was caught. Have we ruled out time travel? Welcome to A Brief History of the Past. I'm Caelan Burrows and today we're exploring the history of the Blackout Ripper. Now the Blackout Ripper is a moniker coined by newspapers for serial killer Gordon Cummins. Now Cummins brutally murdered four women across six days in February of 1942. Whew. Starting the year off on a lighter note I see. Full disclosure everyone. Due to the grim nature of the Ripper's crimes, there will be one or two graphic descriptions of crime scenes in this video, though I will do my best to keep it as light as possible. Excellent! To help understand how Cummins operated with such impunity, we must first look at when he was stalking the streets of London. 1942 was smack in the middle of World War II, and London had imposed blackout regulations to help prevent enemy bombers from identifying targets by sight. During a blackout, external lights were switched off, windows and doors were covered to prevent light from escaping, and outdoor essential lights were outfitted with covers to direct light beams towards the ground. That seems like an awful lot of work. I mean, why not just have all the wizards cast knocks? Huh? What do you mean Harry Potter's not real? <laughs> <laughs> Muggle. Are you incapable of restraining yourself, or do you take pride in being an insufferable know-it-all? Some military historians have said that blackouts weren't really that effective because bomber crews focused more on large bodies of water, railroad tracks, and large highways for navigation. Well, I just steered the Cerebus. Don't really navigate. In fact, blackouts caused a lot of problems on the ground. Night driving fatalities increased, and crime, particularly looting, burglary, gang activity, rape, and murder were out of control under the cover of darkness. How did that work? I mean, wouldn't criminals have a hard time doing crimes in the dark? Oi, Frank! Frank, you there? Yeah. Who's that? It's me, Jerry. Have you nicked anything yet? I can't see nothing. Oh, wait, wait, I think, I, I think I've got something. Oh, it's big, whatever it is. But I think it's a person. Jerry? It's not me. No, it's me. Right. Who are you then? I'm Batman. The body of 40-year-old Evelyn Hamilton was found on Monday, February 9th, 1942, in an air raid shelter in Montague Place. Scotland Yard initially thought she was the victim of a robbery as she'd been strangled and her handbag had been stolen. Chief Superintendent Frederick Cheryl was a genius at identifying single fingerprints at crime scenes, which was a difficult task at the time. He was brought to the scene of the crime and was able to deduce, based on the bruising patterns, that the assailant was left-handed. Yeah. Well, maybe that's just what he wanted everyone to think. I am going to get to the truth. The second victim, 35-year-old Evelyn Oatley, was found the next day on February 10th in her flat on Warder Street. Wait, Wait uh, they were both named Evelyn? Well, there you go. Maybe he just got triggered by the name Evelyn. Why did you say that name? Evelyn had been strangled before having her throat cut. It's believed that she was still alive when the killer sexually mutilated her with curling tongs and a can opener. Okay, now, I'll, I'll see what's going on here. You know what a weak stomach I have after doing that Jack the Ripper video, and you're trying to get me to retch again. Well, as you can see, that had no effect on me. C.S. Charles was able to pull a single fingerprint off of one of the killer's tools, which were left on display near the body. Charles was able to determine that the murderer was left-handed. Charles, along with Detective Sidney Birch, made a leap that the two crimes were connected, though they couldn't yet prove it. 
Yeah. Oh, Cheryl and Birch solving crimes, just like all the great crime fighting duos, right? Riggs and Murtaugh, Starsky and Hutch, Cagney and Lacey, Laverne and Shirley. We have to stop them, but first we have to find out who the him is, and in order to do that, we gotta think like a killer. Things get a bit dodgy after the first two victims, in that there don't seem to be a general consensus on the order of events. After checking multiple sources and even watching murder maps on Netflix, no one can agree on when the next victims were killed or discovered, so I'll do my best. Personally, I blame Hitler. Though, I, I do blame Hitler for a lot of things. Mm. What? 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 No! No! What? No! No, I didn't eat your ice cream. What? I don't know. It's probably Hitler. The third victim... 43-year-old prostitute Margaret Lowe was found in a flat on Gosfield Street. She was most likely killed on Tuesday the 11th, though her body wouldn't be discovered for at least a few days, and she had been well more brutalised than the first two victims. Okay, you know what? You know what? Bring on the descriptors. I can take whatever you got. Do your worst. Okay, swear for it! Margaret had been strangled with a silk scarf or a stocking. Pretty standard so far. She also suffered deep cuts to her thigh. Her abdomen had been ripped open, exposing her... her... her intestines and internal organs. No, I'm, I'm fine. I'm, I'm fine, I just... I just need a minute. Hey, will you say we grab a couple burritos? 32-year-old Doris Jeanette was found in a ground floor flat at Sussex Gardens on February 13th. Doris was married but had a reputation for having casual sex with strangers for fun and money. She had been strangled with a scarf and sexually mutilated, similar to the previous two victims, though the police would be finding the body of Margaret Lowe around a similar time frame as Doris. And thank you for keeping out the more explicit details this time. I don't think I could take it. Woo! What's that? Her, her body was still warm when they found it. <laughs> it was at this point that newspapers had learned about some of the victims and the moniker The Blackout Ripper was born. Newspapers reported about the vicious murders spreading fear throughout London. Yeah, that's what Londoners needed more of back then. I've got good news and bad news, everyone. The good news is that the paper will have no war coverage today. Uh, the bad news is they are covering the brutal murder of four women by someone stalking the city during the blackouts. <laughs> so, oh wait, no, that's, that's still sort of war-related, isn't it? Well, never mind on the good news. The next two victims were actually assaulted the day before Doris and Margaret were found, and both survived their encounters. While Cummins was attacking 32-year-old Greta Hayward in a doorway near Piccadilly Circus, an 18-year-old night porter happened upon the scene, causing Cummins to flee. Wait. He ran away from a delivery boy? Well, that's just silly. I mean, what, what if he had ordered a murder weapon, right, and this lad was just dropping it off? I mean, why pay for Prime if you're not going to take advantage of next day shipping? What's in the box? While not seen as a crucial clue initially, Cummins, who was a serviceman in the Royal Air Force, left his service respirator behind when he fled Piccadilly Circus. Even though the police hadn't connected the botched assault to the Ripper case, they did contact the RAF to find out the owner of the respirator using the serial number. <laughs> <laughs> they used a serial number to track down a serial killer. <laughs> That's what you call ironic. <laughs> huh? What do you mean it's not? Cummins was not deterred by his initial failure, and that same night, he happened upon a prostitute named Catherine Mulcahy. He started off cordially, offering to pay her five pounds for her services back at a flat near Paddington Station. Once there, Cummins attempted to strangle Catherine, but she still had her boots on and kicked him hard in the shin, prompting Cummins to drop a five pound note and run away, leaving his belt behind. Hmm. Ouch! That really hurt! Why, why would you kick me there? I've got sensitive shins! 
No, 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 just, just take it, just take it. Take, take everything, just please don't hurt me no more. <laughs> it's thought that after those failures, Cummins went on to murder Doris that same night. I don't understand murderers, you know? I mean, you get scared off by a porter, right? You get beaten up by a girl. At what point do you just call the night, you know? Go home, beat yourself with a belt, have a good wank. I assume that's what they do. Sick. After the night out, Cummins returned to the RAF reception centre in the early morning hours, only to be taken into custody by police for questioning about the attack on Greta Haywood. Cummins was charged with common assault, but he didn't get off that easy. Speaking of having a good wank, eh? Too soon? It's too soon. Police matched a fingerprint from the scene of the second victim to a print on the inside of the respirator mask. They also found debris in the respirator that came from the bomb shelter where the first victim was found. See? See, that's why you never take your work home. Or, you know, to where you're going to commit murders. Logical. Police also found belongings from three of the victims in Cummins' quarters at the RAF. Whew. Can I just say, I'm glad this bloke was another git so he was caught before he could hurt anyone else. Of course! Cummins was charged with all four murders on February 17th. While Cummins declared his innocence, the evidence against him was overwhelming and it took the jury only 35 minutes to reach a guilty verdict. That seems like 34 minutes too long. Who was in there deliberating? Oh, okay, okay, look, look, it looks bad for Cummins, I know, but hear me out, right? What if, right? What if Jack the Ripper time traveled to now and framed him for the murders? Who are you? You're not even on the jury. Someone get the bailiff. Gordon Cummins was executed by hanging for the murder of four women on June 25th, 1942. Hang on. We were still hanging people in the 40s? Huh? The last person hanged in England was in 1960, 1964? I've got to have a talk with the Queen about this. Can you set that up? Yeah, no, she's not returning my calls. <laughs> Thank you, darling. <laughs> Hello! Oh, no, no, dear. <laughs> oh, darling. How <laughs> silly of me. <laughs> Hello! There you have it, everyone. A brief history of the Blackout Ripper. Let me know what sort of history topics you'd like to see me discuss on future videos in the comments below. Thanks. And I'll see you all in the future. I mean, me personally, I feel like that, you know, that I'm going to start it over. Yeah. Thanks for watching, everyone. If you enjoyed this video, please consider giving it a like and a share. Don't forget to subscribe and click that bell icon to be notified when more Brief History of the Past videos go up. And check out some of the other videos we have on the channel. You might find something else that you like.